afternoon, everyone. I just got off our call with fellow governors and the White House officials, and here's what we heard. First, they shared the latest on the progress on approving the vaccine for those under 12, which will be a major step forward when it comes. Dr. Fauci reported that clinical trials for vaccines for those 11 and under are going well, and that Pfizer will have enough data to submit for an EUA by as soon as early or mid-September. At that point, it would be in the FDA's hands on the regulatory side. It's important to note that on the logistical side, things will be a bit different. There will be a dedicated supply due to uh, the dosage being lower uh, for younger kids than we're using now for those 12 and over. But on the other uh, side as well, there is plenty of supply available. We also heard about the FDA's full approval of the Pfizer vaccine, which governors have been advocating for on these calls for quite some time. We know there are many who haven't been vaccinated yet and have said one thing holding them back was that the vaccine was only approved under emergency authorization. Now, with the FDA's approval of the Pfizer vaccine, they've confirmed what we already know, that vaccines are safe, effective, and can save your life. So, if you've been on the fence, I hope this news will help inspire you to join well over 400,000 of your fellow Vermonters and get vaccinated. It's the single most important thing you can do to protect yourself and your community. Next, as you'll see in Commissioner Pichak's modeling report, although COVID cases have increased in Vermont, the rate of the increase continues to slow, which we believe means that we'll begin to see the same decrease other countries have experienced with Delta very soon. Only a fraction of a percent of vaccinated Vermonters have gotten COVID. And despite what you may have read, the gap between vaccinated and unvaccinated cases continues to widen, meaning unvaccinated cases are going up at a higher rate than vaccinated cases. As well, when you're reading about these numbers, and they're only broken down by vaccinated versus unvaccinated, it's not a fair comparison or analysis. As you know, the number of people who are vaccinated in Vermont significantly outnumber those that aren't. So you can't just compare the total number of vaccinated cases to unvaccinated cases. You have to look at the rates, which show you that vaccinated cases are just a very small percentage. The evidence is clear. Being vaccinated significantly reduces your risk of getting COVID and experiencing more severe outcomes in the unlikely event that you, do, that you do contract it. Next, we'll be discussing the return to school, and we're joined by Deputy Secretary of Education, Heather Boucher, as well as State Epidemiologist, Patsy Kelso, to share some important information. But first, I wanna remind folks how important it is that we're returning to full in-person instruction five days a week. We know um, that uh, in-person instruction um, uh, is important to our, to our kids, and Vermont has had more in-person instruction than most even over last year. That's why earlier this month we issued our recommendations to school districts on how to safely return uh, to class. First, we believe and strongly recommend that masks be required for all students of all ages at the start of the year. For students under 12 who are currently ineligible for the vaccine, we are asking districts to mandate masking until they're approved to receive the vaccine and are fully vaccinated. As you know, without a state of emergency in place, the state cannot require this unilaterally, which is why weeks ago, we issued our recommendations to districts to give them time to implement at the local level. We believe this common sense approach will allow our kids to get back on track and make up some of the lost ground in a safe and productive way. 
And when we reach, when we reach a time when vaccines are approved for those under 12, I'm confident we can continue to show the nation how it's done, lead on vaccination rates, and reduce remaining mitigation measures. Again, Secretary Boucher and Dr. Kelso will provide more thoughts, but next I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for the data rep uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I want to start where we have for the last couple of weeks of uh, looking at the national trends, the regional trends, and the Vermont trends, particularly as it relates to case growth uh, over the last uh, six, seven, eight weeks. Taking a look at the first slide, uh, this shows, as the governor said, that national case growth has risen this week yet again, but that rate of growth has slowed down. Further, the ensemble model from the CDC that puts together dozens and dozens of models from across the country anticipates that cases nationally will slow down and then start to decrease. Looking at the next slide, you can see that rate of decrease nationally continuing to slow down, down from in the 60s, 50s, 30s. Uh, last week, the rate of growth was 19% and now 14% this week. And a particular mention that some of the states hit the hardest earlier on, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, they're seeing their cases plateau. Uh, and in Louisiana and Missouri's case, start to come down as well. So that is leading to the sort of national trend that we're seeing. A little bit closer to home in New England, we're seeing a similar uh, uh, story play out where the cases regionally have gone up, uh, but that increase, about 4,000 cases compared to last week, uh, is the slowest rate of increase that we've seen uh, over the last six or seven weeks. Looking at the next chart, you can see, similar to the country, we had growth rates into the 60, 50, and 40% range. Uh, and then last week, the growth rate was 19%, coming down to 9% this week. And similarly, here in Vermont, we see that uh, we increased our cases week over week by about 40. So that's the smallest week over week increase that we've seen, up from uh, 758 cases last week to 798 cases this week. So again, if we look at what that means for the growth rate, we can see here in Vermont the same trend where the growth rate increased as cases were increasing more quickly, leveling out, and then that rate of growth falling down. So the next week, we really want to look at the data closely in anticipation of the case rate not just slowing down, but cases actually starting to decline as well. When you look at the next slide, this is the reproduction rate. We talked about this a lot throughout the pandemic, uh, but you can see that Vermont's reproduction rate was increasing early on during this wave. Basically, for every person that's infected, how many other people will that person infect? And you can see that that number is now getting down close to zero, or to, to one rather, which basically means that you're starting to spread it to less than a person, meaning that cases will start to fall. So that is certainly a good sign. And again, we're right on the cusp of that. Really important to see how that case data plays out uh, over the next week. And that all leads into the Vermont forecast, where we can see that the ensemble forecast from the CDC, again, combining dozens of models from across the country, anticipates Vermont's cases continuing to slow down and then starting to drop. So that's what we hope and anticipate seeing, and we'll spend a good deal of time uh, looking at uh, in the week ahead. Looking a little bit more granularly at the data, like we usually do, you can see that the case rates are continuing to be significantly different for those who are unvaccinated compared to those who are vaccinated. So in the unvaccinated rates, you can see that that rate of increase is about 28% compared to the 18% in the fully vaccinated case rates. So the fully vaccinated rates, less cases growing less quickly than those who are unvaccinated. So it continues to be you know, a situation where our case growth is being driven by those who are not uh, fully vaccinated. Again, to represent this, this is a little bit different than the representation we showed last week. This is actually a per, you know, this is actually showing it uh, on a scale, on a per, you know, per, per capita scale, where you're seeing the amount of people vaccinated, fully vaccinated in Vermont in that large green box. In that yellow box, you're seeing the number of breakthrough cases that we've seen. Again, this is in proportion to scale. And then in those smaller boxes, which you can't even really see visually here, uh, you see the number of hospitalizations and the number of deaths that have resulted from a breakthrough case. If we magnify this 100 times on the next slide and blow up that little box, 
you'll see just how infrequent it is for a fully vaccinated person to end up in the hospital and for a fully vaccinated person uh, to succumb to COVID-19. So again, continue to have strong confidence in the vaccines. And the next slide shows that as well. Real world data showing the highest vaccinated states to the lowest vaccinated states with Vermont on there as well. Vermont continues to have a lower rate in terms of cases, hospitalizations and fatalities than even those other states that are highly vaccinated like Vermont. And just want to mention also that Vermont has no pediatric uh, hospitalizations uh, at the moment as well. And we continue to be, even though uh, the hospitalization rate has increased, continues to be the lowest hospitalization rate uh, in the country. Turning to um, a more a topical subject, uh, higher education restart. This is the first snapshot from our higher education institutions about the level of vaccination on campus. Uh, we don't have all of the institutions reporting yet. Not all of them are starting this week, some next week, some after Labor Day. But we have 13 of the 16 institutions in Vermont reporting. Uh, some of those institutions are still gathering uh, information from their students. But still, it paints a pretty uh, encouraging picture where of the you know, 24,500 students that are enrolled in these 13 institutions, about 90% of them are fully vaccinated. Another 5.8% or so uh, have a, a status that's not vaccinated. Students that are between shots, students that are from foreign countries that are waiting to get vaccinated when they come to Vermont, students that are just simply in the process of providing the information to the school. And then there's some unknown students as well, about 3%. And of those exemptions that have been granted from schools, uh, that's only about 350 uh, incidents, so uh, about 1.4%. So again, you can see this is the first snapshot. We'll update this week over week uh, as more of those not vaccinated and unknown statuses move to different categories. But you can see um, higher education, a really good position uh, to start uh, the fall semester as it relates to vaccination status. Uh, turning to the long-term care facility slide that we uh, mentioned that we put back into the presentation, you can see that there are four current outbreaks across Vermont, uh, totaling 62 cases uh, at this moment. Uh, turning to vaccinations, want to um, update here and mention that we had over 3,000 people start vaccination this week. That's an about an 11 percent increase from last week. Uh, and you can see that the number of eligible Vermonters still waiting to be vaccinated has dropped below 80 percent. So with the news about the full FDA authorization, hope to see those numbers continue to climb uh, in the weeks ahead. And you can see on the next chart that they have been on the increase again for about the last six or seven weeks. So bringing us to our scoreboard, you know, we see on the vaccine front, we see that Vermont continues to be number one across the board. We often talk about that 85.6% number. That's the number of Vermonters who have received at least one dose. Uh, but just as important or even more critically important in the face of Delta is that fully vaccinated number, 76.4%, uh, which Vermont has been a nation leader in for quite some time. And if you look at the next slide, and Dr. Levine will reiterate this, you'll see the importance of that second shot of following through and getting the full vaccinated uh, uh, number of shots that you need to get fully vaccinated. Hawaii and Vermont have almost identical case uh, vaccination rates when it comes to the first shot, uh, but there is quite a bit of deviation when it comes to uh, those in Vermont and those in Hawaii who are fully vaccinated, who have received all of their doses. And you can see that play out in the Hawaii case rates. The rates you know, are at least two and a half times greater than Vermont. Uh, again, by not being fully vaccinated, they're not getting the full protection of the vaccines. And it's important for Vermonters uh, who are between doses to follow through and get their dose, or even Vermonters who are late uh, to make an attempt to uh, get that second dose to get the full protection against the Delta variant. So with that, uh, I'll turn the presentation uh, over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I try to keep these presentations short. I failed miserably uh, on this presentation. There's a lot of data that I want to go over uh, today. In a minute, I'm going to cover the uh, various walk-in vaccination sites open at schools and pop-up locations across the state this week. 
But first, I want to touch on a couple of other pro uh, topics. The first topic is patient capacity at our hospitals. We look at hospitalization data every day, often twice a day. Actually, I looked at it just before I came in here. We have seen increasing number of patients in some hospitals, but this is also driven by several factors other than COVID. As of today, there are 34 people with COVID-19 that are hospitalized. For context, this is about half of the number of COVID hospitalizations we saw earlier in the year. And as uh, Commissioner Pichek had mentioned, it's, it's the uh, best in the nation in terms of keeping our hospitalization rate low. As you will see in today's data, our COVID, uh, as you saw in Commissioner Pichek's data, our COVID case rate growth numbers are actually starting to plateau. Hopefully this trend will continue. Of course, we will continue to watch this data to see if there are any changes we have to make along the way. Besides COVID, what we're seeing is that people are seeking care that they may have delayed or couldn't easily access earlier in the pandemic. As a result, they may be showing up sicker and requiring hospitalization. We're also seeing uh, people seeking mental health services showing up in the emergency departments. This is particularly happening, happening at UVMMC. Mental health capacity has been an issue pre-pandemic and it continues to ebb and flow throughout the year. To assist with this, the Vermont Department of Mental Health is bringing on more staff, including travelers as required to open up nine closed beds at the Vermont Psychiatric uh, Care Hospital in Berlin. The first five of these beds should be open in mid-September. In addition, the Brattleboro Retreat has 12 new level one adult beds and four pediatric beds. The retreat is act actively seeking staff to open up those beds. We anticipate that six of them will be also be coming online in mid-September. Next, I want to cover additional vaccine doses as well as upcoming booster shots. This will occur in two phases. The first phase, which is already underway, involves those who have weakened immune system and have received the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. The FDA recommends an additional dose for these individuals. This is a relatively small group of people nationwide, approximately 3% of the population. Individuals should talk to their primary health care provider about whether getting an additional dose is appropriate for them. Many primary care providers and pharmacies are trained and equipped to give an additional dose to those who are eligible. We also are augmenting the primary care and, physician and pharmacy capability with our pop-up and school-based vaccination sites. The sites that I'll cover in a minute are all equipped to provide an additional dose to eligible individuals. These are walk-in only sites and you will have to self-attest that you qualify when you go in. Between primary care providers, pharmacies, and our pop-up and school sites, the process should go smoothly. Now, on the second phase that I mentioned, the federal government has recommended booster shots for the general population. This is tentatively scheduled to begin the week of September 20th. Individuals become eligible for a booster shot eight months after they've received their second dose of their vaccine. We have been planning for administering boosters and we expect to start out with healthcare workers and those in long-term care facilities and then expand the effort to the larger population. We have a, the experience, the infrastructure and the partnerships needed to do this phase efficiently. As was the case when we had the mass vaccination effort starting back in the spring, We'll be leveraging our hospitals, pharmacies, EMS personnel, the National Guard, state employees, and health care providers. And this time around, Vermonters will have even more options as primary care offices join the effort. Boosters are currently recommended for those who receive the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. The federal government is gathering more data on Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the coming weeks. If vaccinations are approved for those that are 2 to 11 age range, we may use some of the same infrastructure in addition to our school-based clinics and pediatric and other primary care practices to get children vaccinated. Turning to the vaccination rates, as you saw, 
uh, in Commissioner Pichek's presentation, 85.6% of eligible Vermonters have received at least one dose of the vaccine. 76.4% of all eligible Vermonters are fully vaccinated. You can walk in and get vaccinated at most local pharmacies, including those in grocery stores. You can also visit pharmacy locations at UVM Medical Center, the Community Health Centers of Burlington, Northwestern Medical Center, and the Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. In addition to those options, we continue to offer school-based and pop-up clinics each week. I want to remind everyone that school is one of the most convenient places for students to get vaccinated. Now through October, vaccination clinics will be offered at schools. Among those aged 12 to 17, 71.2% have already received at least one dose of vaccine. Please get your eligible children vaccinated. Finally, here's where you'll find 36 pop-up and school-based clinics. Today, Green Mountain Tech Center in High Park, Bellas Falls Academy in Fairfax, Johnson Elementary School in Johnson, Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services in Brattleboro. Tomorrow, August 25th, Brattleboro Union High School in Brattleboro, Oxbow High School in Bradford, the Woodstock Inn in Woodstock, Wells River Chevrolet in Wells River, Putney Fire Department in Putney, 1113 Barry Montpelier Road in Berlin, and the Waterbury Ambulance in Waterbury Center. On Thursday, August 26th, South Burlington High School in South Burlington, Barrytown EMS in Barry, Rutland, the Rutland District Health Office in 88 Merchants Row in Rutland, Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services in Springfield, Waterbury Farmers Market in uh, Waterbury on Friday, the Caledonia County Fair in Lindenville, the Champlain Valley Fair in Essex Junction, the Bonville Fair in Bonville, the Newport Waterford uh, Plaza in Newport, Middlebury Union High School in Middlebury, Blue Mountain High School in Wells River, St. Johnsbury Academy in St. Johnsbury, and again, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road here in Berlin. Um, on Saturday, Caledonia County Fair in Lindenville, the Chandler Center for Arts in Randolph, the Highland Center for Arts in Greensboro, the U32 High School in Montpelier, the Richford High School in Richford, again, the Bonville Fair in Bonville, the Champlain Valley Fair in Essex Junction, the West Fairley Old Home Day in Fairley, and then on Sunday, Caledonia County Fair uh, in Lindenville, the Crossick uh, Brook Middle School in Duxbury, Virgin's High School in Virgin's Champlain Valley Fair again. Uh, please take advantage of the opportunities to get vaccinated. As you can see, we've provided ample opportunity out there to get vaccinated at very sort of high traffic areas. Um, so please take the opportunity to get uh, vaccinated. You can find information about these COVID vaccination sites at the health department's website, which is healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. I'll now turn it over to Dr. L Levine for, I'm not turning it, but I'm turning it over to Heather. Heather, you're up. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Good afternoon. Many Vermont schools are back to school this week, as the governor noted. And with that in mind, I'll briefly remind us of the state's recommendations for public health and safety measures for back to school this fall. In addition to urging all eligible Vermont residents who can get vaccinated to do so, as we just heard, we recommend that districts require students and staff to stay home if they are sick, Schools are recommended to use the same resources provided by the health department last year to evaluate health and wellness, testing, and return to school timelines. Please stay home if you show symptoms of COVID-19, have a fever, or are currently in quarantine or isolation due to COVID-19. In addition, if symptoms begin while at school, students or staff should be sent home as soon as possible. Regarding facial coverings, we recommend that schools require everyone, students and staff alike, to wear a mask for the first 10 instructional days of the school year. 
After that time, if more than 80% of eligible students have received their second dose of vaccine, schools may list mask mandates for both eligible students and staff. If the proportion of eligible students vaccinated is less than 80%, all staff and students should continue to wear masks. Students aged 11 and under who are not yet eligible for the vaccine should continue to wear masks while in school. Finally, students and staff should not have to wear masks outdoors. Without a declared state of emergency, our recommendations are advisory, but the authority of school districts and independent schools is not. They have a duty of care to their students and the responsibility and authority to take action to ensure their health and safety. We're seeing good things from Vermont schools as they set up their local requirements and update their families on the process for the new school year. For instance, Colchester School District just sent home a beautiful, clear health and safety guide with information on staying home when sick, mask wearing requirements, contact tracing, testing, and vaccination information all in one place. Please know that we will continue to assess the situation and provide updates and additional recommendations as the need arises. In terms of surveillance testing, the state is again offering this testing for all students and staff as we did in the spring and over the summer. Currently, school districts are enrolling in the program administered by the health department. Several districts are starting this week and next with the remainder coming online in the next few weeks. And it's now recommended that all students and staff get tested often, regardless of whether they are vaccinated. In terms of contact tracing, the health department will again be working directly with school districts and independent schools to conduct contact tracing in response to cases and situations in schools. And I believe Dr. Kelso will outline more on that in just a few moments. Before I close, I want to give a bit more detail about the authority of supervisory districts to keep students safe that I referenced a moment ago. We released a memo on this to districts last week that briefly stated, under Vermont law, districts have broad authority and responsibility to soundly administer their, uh, to soundly administer their schools, including adopting local policies, practices, and actions to keep their students safe and healthy. This includes policies and practices to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 in their learning community. It is important to know that the details of how districts choose to address um, and prevent the transmission of, of COVID-19 may vary from district to district. Some school boards may set a mask policy themselves, whereas others may delegate COVID-19 decisions to the superintendent, district nurses, and COVID-19 coordinators. Districts are unlikely to make the same exact decisions or follow the exact same time frame for mitigation practices across the state. That is okay. What is important is that local school officials are stepping up and exercising their local authority and responsibility to make the health and safety decisions that work for their community. I also wanna note that we have been hearing about a few thankfully not, um, not in any kind of widespread way, but a few contentious conversations regarding masking and COVID-19 mitigation measures. This is perhaps to be expected given our experiences navigating COVID to date, um, particularly from a national perspective. However, we urge any such conversations to remain civil, measured, and respectful. Again, school boards, school administrators, and educators are working hard and making decisions in the best interests of health and safety for everyone. You can disagree with their decisions, but it is not okay to threaten or intimidate them. And threats of violence are never acceptable. I also ask that folks please not disrupt the start of school in any way. Activities that disrupt the school day or interrupt learning time deprive our students of the stability and connection with their teachers and peers that they all need as we start the new school year. Ultimately, such activity just isn't fair to our kids. Finally, I'd like to end on a note of optimism. It is truly great that we're able to start the school year in person with a streamlined set of common sense safety and health measures. It's not something folks can take for granted in other parts of the country. And the fact that we're starting from a good place here in Vermont is due to our collective efforts over the past 18 months. And the fact that so many Vermonters stepped up and got vaccinated when it was their turn. As both an educator and a parent myself, 
I can say that it's incredibly valuable to have kids returning to the classroom, to PE and sports, to music and drama, and all the many other extracurriculars available, and also more generally to spending time together with their friends, which we know is incredibly valuable in the context of learning and development for our students. We're hearing from educators, parents, and community members that students are excited to return to school with less worry and restrictions than there were last year. And I just want to say that I'm profoundly grateful to everyone who worked so hard to make this possible. I will now turn the podium over to Dr. Kelso. The Health Department will support schools in their contact tracing efforts in the same way that we did last year. Schools will conduct contact tracing when a student or staff was present in school or was at a school event while infectious. Schools might learn of these exposures or situations when a family or staff member notifies the school or when the Health Department identifies an exposure during our contact tracing process and then lets the school know. When schools learn about an exposure, they'll first verify that the student or staff person was at school while they were infectious. They'll identify their close contacts in the school setting and then review the situation and close contact decisions with the health department. And keep in mind, if you're fully vaccinated, even if you're a close contact to a case, you do not need to quarantine. Schools will also notify close contacts at the school about their exposure using a quarantine letter and other resources provided by the health department and give testing guidance as needed. And then they'll loop back with the health department to share information. Schools know their families best and this method was successful last year. Also, families might be more likely to answer a call from their child's school and that can help speed up the contact tracing process. If we want to keep our kids in school and we all agree that's where they need to be, we all need to do our part. And you've heard uh, bits of this before. Most importantly, get vaccinated if you're eligible. Stay home if you're sick, even if you have a mild illness. Get tested if you have any symptoms, even if you think it's allergies or a cold, and even if you're vaccinated. And if you're in a household with children who can't be vaccinated yet or someone with a weakened immune system, consider wearing a mask when indoors in public settings. Finally, I want to speak to the kids and the parents and caregivers of kids who are involved in group activities they're passionate about doing. Whether it's sports, music, theater, or anything else, your chances of doing what you love this school year will be much greater if you do one simple thing, get vaccinated. Getting vaccinated will help you all be successful in reaching your, your goals together. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. <clears throat> Thanks, Dr. Kelso. So the Delta variant continues to drive COVID activity in the U.S., including here in Vermont. Its high transmissibility is cause for concern, but fortunately our most powerful tool against this new version of the virus, the vaccine, is doing its job. Fully vaccinated people, that's more than 434,000 Vermonters, are highly protected from serious illness, hospitalization, and death including against the Delta variant. It's always been our goal to prevent the worst effects of the virus. That is our public health mission, and we achieve that goal through vaccination. We've already seen data, both in clinical trials and in the real world, showing the safety and effectiveness of all three vaccines. But as you've all heard, the Pfizer vaccine reached an important milestone yesterday with full approval from the FDA for people 16 and older. It continues to be available under the emergency use authorization for people aged 12 to 15 and for the third dose in certain people with immunocompromising conditions. All of the COVID vaccines had to pass rigorous scientific standards to get their emergency use authorization. Now I and other public health officials around the country believe that the FDA's full approval delivers increased confidence that the Pfizer vaccine meets even higher standards, including the empirical evidence and studies from millions of vaccinations worldwide. Yesterday's authorization may reassure, and I hope does reassure, 
some unvaccinated people awaiting this additional level of review. If you are waiting for full approval to get vaccinated, please take the opportunity to find a clinic and protect yourself as soon as you can. The FDA's action may also allow for employers to require the vaccine for their employees. As I've said many times, this is a safe and effective vaccine, and I encourage anyone not yet vaccinated to go to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine to see where you can get a shot near you. And anyone who's had that first dose, you're not yet fully protected, so be sure to get your second dose. Getting full protection is even more important as the Delta variant spreads. While effectiveness of the messenger RNA vaccines after both doses can be as high as 94% against Delta, effectiveness after one dose can be as low as 30 or 40%. 93% of people in Vermont who are eligible for their second shot have had their second shot, leaving only 7% of those who've had their first shot overdue for the second. So if you took the trouble to get your first shot, definitely get your second. It's more important in the time of Delta than ever before. In fact, you saw some of the data that Commissioner Pichek showed about Hawaii and Vermont and the biggest difference is our rate of people fully vaccinated, not just the rate of one dose, but fully vaccinated, being ultimately so much more protective for our population. If you're still due for your second dose, you should get it as close to the recommended three or four week interval as possible. However, it may be given up to six weeks after the first dose if necessary. There's currently limited information on the effectiveness of receiving your second dose, either earlier than recommended or later than six weeks after the first shot. Now that I've given that important reminder, let me say a few words concerning what everyone is talking about now, which is booster shots for the general population. As we said last time, these may be available as early as September 20th for people who got their vaccine the earliest way back in December and January. I want to mention some research findings today yet to be peer-reviewed from the Israeli Health Ministry Panel of Vaccine effort, Experts. Their encouraging news about the effectiveness of vaccine boosters in seniors was that a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine provided four times as much protection against infection as two doses did. The level of protection was five to six times higher against serious illness and hospitalization. Now, Israel has been administering third doses in those over age 60 for about a month now, and it just reduced their age to 40 for those who received their second, second shot more than five months ago. As we've said before, anyone who's unvaccinated is at greater risk of getting and spreading the virus. This includes children who can't be vaccinated right now, those age 11 and under. Fortunately, in Vermont, our rates of vaccination among people who are eligible are high enough that that will help reduce the spread. But as you've heard, we will likely see cases in schools this fall, just as we're seeing cases in other parts of our communities right now, whether that be workplaces, childcare, summer camps, healthcare settings. The students and teachers who go to school every day represent the communities they come from and the level of transmission of virus in those communities. But there is some good news. If the Delta variant trends hold, we believe, as you saw on the slide, that this surge may last weeks and not months. Once cases do go down, they should also become less common in our communities and schools once again. In the meantime, we all believe it's important for children to have and enjoy as normal an educational experience as possible in school, keeping up social connections and activities. Our schools and their staff have been and continue to be amazing partners with knowledge and experience in keeping their communities safe. Fortunately, data shows any severe effects from COVID-19 in children continue to be rare in Vermont. 
We can all help protect our schools and our communities by doing our part to reduce spread. By one, getting vaccinated if you're eligible. Two, staying home if you're sick and getting tested if you have any symptoms. Three, wearing a mask indoors if you're not fully vaccinated. Four, if you are fully vaccinated, consider wearing a mask indoors as an extra layer of protection. If you have a weakened immune system or are around someone who does, if you have children who can't be vaccinated, if you're traveling to a place with higher transmission and lower vaccination rates, or if you just feel more comfortable wearing one and want to benefit others by reducing further your already very low risk of transmitting the virus. If you or your child are headed back to school soon, I recommend you consider skipping travel to a higher risk area and to get tested if you do choose to do so. Those of you who've been faithfully watching these press conferences will recognize I said this one year ago as well. It was good advice then and it remains so now. In summary, the Delta variant is not the same virus we dealt with a year ago, but we do have layers of protection we can use as we weather this current surge. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and the entire team for the presentation today. With that, we'll open up to questions. Hi, the folks in the room. Governor, do you or anyone, has anything shaken your glasses half full approach to this? I mean, have you given any consideration to, I know you, to any additional measures, even if they're just recommendations as opposed to orders? Yeah, I mean, we've given a lot of recommendations. We think it's a good idea uh, to, to mask where appropriate. Uh, be in indoor settings uh, that would, uh, where there's a lot of people uh, who you don't know. I mean, that's, those are just common sense solutions that we've learned a lot uh, about over the last 18 months. You know, when we started this, we, we had no playbook whatsoever. We were going on the seat of our, from the seat of our pants, deciding what to do and, and addressing things as they came up. But again, we've learned a lot about what this virus does and doesn't do. And certainly with the new variant, it's changed a bit. It's become more transmissible. But it's the same virus. And uh, so we know how to mitigate it, or we think we do. Um, we're number one in the nation in so many different categories. Uh, we're doing something right. Uh, and one of those is the vaccinations. And having the highest uh, vaccination rate in the country has given us certain amount of latitude. Am I concerned about what I'm seeing? Of course I am. I, I watch the data constantly. Uh, I'm in contact with my team multiple times a day. We meet almost daily. So we are ready uh, to pivot. We are ready to do whatever is necessary to keep Vermonters safe when we have to. But I watch other states as well. And when we see uh, for instance, uh, Maine uh, put some more restrictions uh, in. Uh, they saw the same thing that we were seeing. They put more restrictions in because of the hospitalizations and so forth. Well, that didn't change their hospitalizations. In fact, they're increasing at a higher rate than ours are. The number of positive cases have increased as well. So their mitigation measures have not helped the situation. When we see other countries, the UK, uh, we see India, uh, Israel and others uh, that are starting to fall off. They fall off dramatically after a certain point in time. We believe, uh, Commissioner Pichak showed that uh, in his presentation, that we'll see that peak and then stop start uh, dropping dramatically uh, about the nine week mark, I believe. So we've been seven weeks into that and we think in a couple weeks we'll see that happen. But we're asking Vermonters to use common sense be vigilant, get your, your vaccinations, and, uh, and continue to, to use your head and, and assess your own situation and do the right thing. But if, the, uh, if that doesn't prove to be the case, if the, uh, the cases don't peak and, and uh, become uh, much more reduced over the next two, three weeks, we may take other measures, but uh, right now we're providing guidance and we, I don't believe a state of emergency is appropriate uh, at this point in time, and that's our only mechanism uh, to do so. 
the state of emergency? What's the downside to doing that right well, now? Well, overuse of the state of emergency. I mean, we went uh, through a period of time uh, where we had a state of emergency longer than any other administration uh, in history. That can be utilized in, in a lot of different ways, misused in a lot of different ways as well. Um, but it should only be used, I mean, the Constitution lays this out, it should only be used in times of real emergency. There's nothing, there's no emergency that we're seeing at this point in time uh, that would, uh, that would uh, force us to go into one. Uh, again, we knew this would happen. The cases aren't expanding dramatically. The hospitalizations are half what we saw in early uh, parts of the year. So until such time as there is an, an emergency, there's no reason to impose one. You don't want to abuse this. The leaders at the legislature uh, just an hour or two ago uh, put out statements that uh, effectively called on you to, to do more, invited you to take further measures, uh, saying that this approach was already putting people at risk. What, what's your response to what they put forth? I did, uh, you know, I was on the call uh, with the White House before this press briefing. So didn't have a lot of time, but I had about 10 minutes before, and I did see the letter from the speaker. I have not reviewed the one from uh, the pro tem, but it followed suit. Um, I think it's unfortunate to play politics at this point in time. I think one of the reasons our pandemic response has been the best in the nation uh, is that we never politicize our response, as other states and other ambitious leaders have done uh, throughout the country. Um, we're 100% focused on serving Vermonters and doing the right thing. Playing politics on this issue isn't going to help the situation or help Vermonters. I did see where the speaker had mentioned that there are five other states who have um, imposed further restrictions. In fact, they still have a state of emergency, I believe. One of them being Louisiana. And that is like night and day to where Vermont is. Now, in Louisiana, if, if we had the same situation in Vermont that they're experiencing in Louisiana, we would have never lifted our state of emergency. We would have never lifted some of the restrictions. We'd still have them today, and we would probably impose a mass mandate if that were the case. Um, they, um, they have 14 times the number of cases we do, 14 times. In their hospitals there, their death rates, their death rate is 62 times what Vermont says. Again, that's like night and day. They should have a state of emergency, and they should be putting uh, restrictions on. And if we were experiencing that in Vermont, we'd be doing the same thing. about breakthrough cases, and maybe Dr. Lee, you can shed some light on this as well. Um, from August 1st, Health Department says, uh, data says from August 1st to August 12th, the state recorded 187 breakthrough cases, which is more than the previous four weeks combined. Um, you know, given the fact that a, a lot of these breakthrough cases really didn't start picking up until mid-July or so, why, why are we including data of, of vaccination data and breakthrough case data from the beginning of the pandemic when the Delta variant, or from January, when the Delta variant wasn't here? I'm not sure I understand the question, but maybe Dr. Levine. Or... Well, we can do it just together. Could you put the slide back up uh, of the uh, graph of the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated? So people at home can't see the numbers here, which are cases per 100,000. But we're in the 10 per 100,000 range on the blue line, which is the vaccinated population. And we're in the 35 or so range per 100,000 uh, for the vaccinated, for the unvaccinated, which is the gold line. So again, 
clearly there's been this major uptick late July and early August in these cases. No denying that. Very important to recognize that. Again, these cases are still out of a denominator that is over 400,000 people. And these cases are out of a denominator that's 100,000 or, or less people. That's a dramatic difference. So yes, if we're going to see cases in Vermont, the cases are going to be in the vaccinated people, because that's almost everybody in the state. And we know this is a transmissible variant that can still impact vaccinated people, even in a vaccine that is 95 to 99 percent effective. So I think that's the perspective you need to look at these cases in. Does that help? Yeah, it does, yes. Uh, Dr. Levine, what's happening with the Johnson & Johnson people when it comes to boosters? Yeah, there's a, oh, do you have an update? Well, they, they talked about it a bit on the oh. White House call, but if you want to. Well, all I was going to say is there's data that's apparently starting to flow in from Johnson & Johnson regarding their experience, because obviously that's important to support any subsequent uh, policy of, of administering boosters. We also know that it wasn't under EUA till a number of months after the mRNA vaccines, so that in theory, if it behaved the same way, uh, people wouldn't even be ready for those boosters at the same time as people who started out in January with the mRNA. Uh, so it's more just having the company's data get analyzed like everything else. But I'll see if the governor has something even more recent. Um, along those same lines uh, as what Dr. Levine just described, Dr. Fauci had said uh, that they are working on this. Um, the data is coming through. He says it's inevitable. Uh, there will be a booster, uh, a, a second dose of the Johnson & Johnson, uh, but it can't be um, it can't be advised uh, because they're under the EUA at this point. Uh, they would have to uh, go to uh, full author authorization before doing so or revamping of uh, the uh, emergency use authorization because that was just for one, one dose. Um, there's some more good news uh, in some respects. Uh, they're not seeing any more cases uh, than they are with any, any other. Uh, of the uh, platforms, Moderna or Pfizer, with Johnson Johnson, so there's no concern there. Um, and they did say uh, that they have finally cleared up the situation in Baltimore, so there is plenty of supply. Millions of doses are going to be available when they do get the da data in, and a booster is, uh, which he feels is, uh, again, inevitable, uh, comes to be. I, just, I wanted to go back a, a little bit uh, to the other question as well. I watch CNN uh, from time to time, and uh, I appreciate, uh, as much as I appreciate uh, do Dr. Levine, uh, Dr. Fauci, I also like uh, Dr. Gupta, Sanjay Gupta. And he has said, um, he's been talking about this issue about the breakthrough cases. And uh, he said that it's a term that's uh, misused, um, that, uh, that these cases that are coming through uh, aren't necessarily uh, that the vaccine is not working uh, because the vaccine, from his perspective, uh, was designed to lessen uh, the, uh, the impacts of this virus on some of the organs, specifically uh, with lungs, and prevent uh, the, the uh, infection from getting to the lungs. And he said, it's working. So these breakthrough cases uh, that are described aren't necessarily what you might think. Uh, they still are helpful and, uh, and are preventing death. So that's it, and you probably should look at what he's written uh, and, uh, and go back to that, because it, it was explained well to me and made a lot of sense. Dr. Levine, uh, I got an email from a viewer that just gave me an idea for a question. He was bringing up the fact that you know, some of the people who are unvaccinated may be so because they had COVID and, um, you know, believe that there's some level of immunity with that. I know this is something you've talked about before, but given the Delta variant, what would be your advice to those people if they have held out on getting vaccinated, believing that they have a good amount of immunity already? Yeah, my advice is really unwavering. It's that um, the data is so strong that shows that even if you've had 
the kind of immunity you get from having had the infection itself, your immune system gets additional benefits from the vaccine to a much, much higher degree, and you are much more fully protected for the future by having gotten the vaccine on top of having had the infection already. So the, it, the data is just uh, very, very compelling. Once this booster process starts rolling out, if somebody has gone, you know, two months after when they were supposed to get the booster, would they still be full, considered fully vaccinated? Has the Department of Health given that any thought when it comes to indoor masking and things like that? So, so a sort of evolving definition of fully vaccinated, basing it on a third dose of vaccine if you've gotten the two dose vaccines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think we've thought of that yet at this point in time. Um, I think at this point in time, we're happy for all the people who've gotten the second dose. Uh, I have no reason to believe Vermonters won't step up to the plate when it comes to their opportunity to get the third dose. Because again, the kind of data that I just uh, recited about Israel, uh, we'll find that kind of data uh, coming in from other locations, including this country as well. And the whole recommendation is based on data about what impact another dose has, not just on like the antibodies in your bloodstream, but actually on what happens to you over time. So it'll be so compelling that I think most Vermonters, just like they come back, you know, for flu shots, the ones who are already getting flu shots, they keep coming back year after year because they know that they're going to get some benefit from that. Eventually, what's going to happen with the SARS-CoV-2 virus is it's going to be sort of in the background all the time, something that's called being endemic, and people are going to be accustomed to the fact that there will be a need for getting booster vaccines at some kind of interval yet to be determined. Would it be annual like the flu shot? Would it be something else? I can't say, but that's what will happen. In nursing homes supposed to get their third shot. It seems like there's a fairly urgent need for, for that population to get these boosters. Yeah, and they're going to be the first on the list, actually, because they were the first on the list. We have a strategy, which Secretary Smith is uh, eager to tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, we are in the planning stages right now of, um, of reinventing or reestablishing how they got their booster shots, or how they got their shots in the beginning, which was through the pharmacy partnership, um, we'll probably reinstitute that process for them. Those pharmacies that worked in certain uh, uh, long-term care facilities would go back to that. We're, we're in that process right now. They will be one of the first. Uh, uh, more specific. Well, problem. after sep you know, there are six thousand of them. After sep September twenty twentieth, will be. Uh, going into them right at that point. So um, we got to get approval. It's got to be approved by, you know, the various federal agencies that need to approve it. But as soon as we're approved, there are two major uh, blocks right out of the gate that will get it, uh, healthcare workers and long-term care facilities. Okay, thank you. Governor, what, what does the school uh, sports guidance look like at this point? That in yeah, I, we have talked about that, and I don't believe anything has changed uh, from the school guidance perspective. Is that correct? Right. So it's just uh, the outside outside events, uh, no masking outside events. And for, for indoors or intercollegiate or um, high school. So I'm just thinking, you know, if a school from New Hampshire comes versus here, that sort of thing. Sure, I just wanted to add a bit. So uh, we are currently considering um, if any additional guidance will be needed for volleyball, which is inside. But uh, Governor Scott is correct in that uh, fall sports, which are largely outside um, the current uh, recommendation stand. What do school districts do uh, that school districts that have chosen to impose their own mask requirements with kids and the parents of those kids who refuse to send their kids to school with masks? Um, so, uh, I guess technically they would look to attendance requirements if the family is still um, considering that their student is enrolled in that school. So there's nothing that would, um, there's nothing that would actually um, 
preclude at, at this point um, that as an excuse for missing school. Um, again, districts have the authority and the responsibility for, for making um, the rules up about how they're actually, the, the practices and policies about how they're actually going to um, mitigate uh, exposure to COVID-19. And so we strongly urge um, families to, to have trust in their local authorities um, who we would argue know their communities best. But in the worst case scenario, I mean, would the district have the ability to keep the kid, the children out of school while this is going on? Um, I was thinking of it from the other perspective. So you're thinking if um, there's a mandate for masking Correct. and um, parents are sending their students without masks. Um, I think that would have to be dealt with at the local level. We certainly do have um, compulsory education um, laws on the books. Um, and so I think, um, I don't necessarily know if we've thought in detail about that situation, but I can certainly get back to you with a legal opinion on that. And I apologize, I thought you were talking about it the other way, which is that, yeah, yeah. I, just from my standpoint, and this isn't a legal opinion, but I would say that they would have the authority to keep them out of school. I mean, it's a restriction that they're placing, and, and um, they wouldn't, from my perspective, wouldn't be allowed to go to school at that point. Um, maybe we go back. Uh, Secretary Moore, do you have anything to add on the sports guidance? Uh, no, Governor. The, what uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher said about the volleyball being the lone indoor sport this fall certainly makes it easier. Um, I do think it's important to maybe connect it with Dr. Kelso's remarks from earlier and remind athletes as well as students that there isn't a need to quarantine um, if they are vaccinated, which could be particularly important during the sports season. And it won't be long before there will be indoor sports, basketball, and others. Uh, so. We'll have to address this fairly soon. Governor, unrelated to COVID, if you don't mind, Horizon Organic is going to be terminating contracts with more than two dozen dairy farms in August of 2022. I know a lot of them seem desperate for a new buyer now. What are your thoughts on this move and what would be your message to farmers who are really nervous about their futures? Yeah, unfortunate situation, obviously. Um, the good news is they've given a year. Um, before they are going to stop picking up milk. Um, that gives us some time to reflect on uh, different strategies. I know I spoke with uh, Secretary Tebbets this morning. Uh, they put a team together to look at this and uh, we're already starting to think about what are the possibilities of other uh, uh, markets and uh, what we can do because we want to make sure that they're viable. It's hitting that smaller to medium size uh, farms uh, dramatically. So uh, we're on it, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a solution before long. Can I just go back to COVID? Um, this might be a question for Dr. Levine, but has anybody actually gotten COVID twice? And we're talking about immunity um, after getting it once. That's a great question. We have um, a small number of people in Vermont who might, in fact, have gotten COVID twice. The actual case definition to, to clearly say that someone has been infected twice is requires you to have whole genome sequencing on both of their specimens from the first time they had COVID as well as the second time so that you can say it's, it's a new infection because it's a different distinct virus. Um, the problem is uh, those few people, small number of people in Vermont who might have had COVID twice, you know, the first time they had it was many months ago and we weren't doing whole genome sequencing then. So technically we have no one who meets the official definition and there are very few um, such cases nationwide. Um, but there, there are probably a small number of people in Vermont who have been infected twice. Is there any, um, do we have any idea if, um, uh, how immunity breaks down by vaccine type, if, there's, if there have been more breakthrough infections from a certain vaccine? 
Yeah, we, we've been looking at that. They're relatively equal. There are small differences. Um, when you look at the proportion of Vermonters who've gotten each of the three types of vaccines and the proportion of um, those Vermonters who are breakthrough infections, um, they're relatively similar. We could get you the actual data. But there are no distinct differences. All right, I will move to the phones now, starting with Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, hoping to start with a non-COVID question to begin with. Uh, Governor, are any of our Vermont National Guard troops working on the efforts in Afghanistan to evacuate people from Cabal? Uh, and are there any possibly guardsmen assisting in the effort outside of the border? Of Afghanistan. Um, I think I would be better uh, to point you towards the guard. Um, I don't want to say anything I shouldn't say. So um, let's. Uh, I'll let you uh, con uh, contact the guard uh, for that question. Okay. Um, and my other question today: um, We're seeing parents, and at least two of our school districts that are standing up against the school boards uh, who are implementing your request to, to have masks mandated for the beginning of the school year. Um, I attended one of those meetings last week uh, in which one of the parents actually kind of pointed out that, that you've been an advocate for personal liberties uh and and said that not wearing a mask should be a personal liberty i, I wondered if you could uh, respond to something like that well in this situation uh, i think it's a it's perfectly appropriate for uh, kids returning to school to to be mass uh, there's a uh, huge population within the schools uh, that haven't had the ability uh, to be vaccinated so uh, I think uh, in this uh, situation, masking is a good idea. As you remember, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we uh, imposed a, a mask policy uh, as well. And we thought that I believe in personal liberty, but that was a good idea then uh, for us to impose it on the uh, broad population. Um, hopefully there'll be a time uh, again when we have enough kids vaccinated where they won't have to wear masks. but. We need kids to get vaccinated as well, and we need to uh, to have the FDA uh, and uh, to approve the under under 11 uh, category so that we can get those kids eligible. So, I think there is a personal liberty. Um, the the parents don't have to send their kids to school. There's homeschooling; they can find another school. Um, but um, but in this case, I think it's perfectly legitimate for the school to impose this, and we, and we, uh, we're, we've advocated for that. Uh, we think it's a good idea. Okay, thank you, Governor. Governor, could I just add one piece? To sure, this? absolutely. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, just to um, follow up on that, is that in the case, back to the original question about schools, in the case where um, a parent sent um, a student to school without a mask and the operating conditions are requiring masks, schools would very likely have a stockpile of masks to offer to each student. And so I think that they would try that first. Um, and then, um, as the governor just mentioned, um, there are other options. Um, but it is true that um, who, who holds the, um, the right to um, decide what the school situation looks like is the actual uh, district at this point. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Um, this is a question about Commissioner Pichek's slides. One of the slides showed that 50% of the critical care hospital patients are unvaccinated. Does that mean that 48% are vaccinated? And can you tell us more about this type of patient? Do they have comorbidities? Yeah, Lisa, so that is correct. That was an average of, uh, you know, the last 13 days that we have data on. Um, so, uh, you know, about 50 percent, 52 percent are fully or sorry, sorry, are unvaccinated, not fully vaccinated. The 48 percent on average that are in the hospital, uh, in the critical care facilities in particular, uh, are breakthrough cases. We don't have at the moment, um, you know, any demographic data about those 
uh, individuals um, at this time, but we can certainly follow up on that. Well, I'd be curious to know. I also noticed that one of the slides talked about the hospitalizations increasing in people older over 70 who would have been those who got their shots in December and January. Did that show the waning efficacy of the vaccine after eight months? Yeah, so certainly. So we have in the broader presentation, we have a slide uh, today that shows sort of the age breakdown, those over 70, you know, those 50 to 69, those middle aged, those younger, and what proportion of hospitalizations those make up. Those are those are hospitalizations just generally. Those aren't specific to ICU. Um, but, you know, I think it's the same story that it has been throughout the pandemic, that older people are more vulnerable. And we've seen plenty of um, even with our high case rates, our high vaccination rates, We've seen plenty of um, cases among vulnerable individuals that aren't vaccinated or aren't fully vaccinated. So, you know, I think it's a, a combination of the fact that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe Delta's, you know, certainly Delta's different. You know, maybe the immuno response in people that are older is different. Maybe the immunity is waning over time. But it's also holding true through the entire pandemic that those that are, that are vulnerable by age continue to remain vulnerable, particularly if they're unvaccinated, of course. Got it. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. And then I had a follow-up question for Dr. Levine about the Israeli data. Did the Israeli data demonstrate a drop in vaccine protection at eight months, or was it earlier in four to five months in those over 70? So the Israeli data, unfortunately, hasn't been published yet, so I can't fill in all the details. This is the high level that the Israeli health ministry released. Uh, we anticipate it's going to end up in a peer-reviewed publication, so we'll be able to answer more of the detail-oriented questions. Okay, thanks very much. Just to expand on the point I was trying to make in my remarks um, with the question for Commissioner Pichek. So if you have 30 cases in the hospital and 15 are vaccinated, 15 are unvaccinated. That's 15 out of over 400,000 of those who are vaccinated, 15 out of four, over 400,000. And on the other side, the unvaccinated, that's 15 out of about 70,000. So it's just a stark difference between the two. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, the revenue, the tax revenue report came out last week, and uh, Secretary Young expressed um, maybe a little concern about whether the economy was softening because the personal income tax uh, did not meet expectations. And now in September, the um, federal pandemic uh, stipend is going to end. And that those people also were paying an income tax on that, personal income tax on that. Are you concerned that, that maybe we're getting into an economic softer period here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in many respects, I'm, I'm concerned about inflation. I'm concerned about a softening. Uh, but on the other hand, when you see, uh, and I believe that the infrastructure package that was passed by the Senate and is now in the House will eventually pass. Uh, that's a, an incredible amount of money that will be injected back into the economy and I think will supplement uh, anything that might be lost due to the supplemental um, stipend in the unemployment benefit. There are plenty of jobs available uh, for those who are losing uh, their benefits, uh, whether it be uh, PUC or PUA. Um, I believe uh, that there are enough jobs available and more so um, as more supply of jobs than there is demand at this point. And, um, and I think that we'll be in, we'll be in good shape uh, if we can uh, work our way through this. But I, but I do believe there's still a lot of federal money coming through. We haven't even begun in some respects uh, utilizing the ARPA money. So uh, I, I don't think there's uh, a great uh, I'm not concerned, uh, but uh, but wary. Thank you very much, Governor. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Thank you, Jason. Um, Governor Scott, Dr. Levine, we're entering uh, a stretch of time here. I guess no one knows how long it'll be exactly when there's only one available vaccine that does have 
full FDA approval um, if Vermonters uh, who have not been vaccinated yet decide that's the vaccine they want to get, um, will you have enough supply to handle the 90 or so thousand Vermonters who are eligible for a vaccine at this point who, ha who have not yet gotten vaccinated? I'll let uh, Dr. Levine weigh on on this, weigh in on this as well. But uh, during the call with the White House today, that that topic came up. Um, they feel there is uh, plenty of supply of Pfizer at this point, but they also said uh, it's not going to be long before Moderna will be given full authorization as well. And following behind that, as I said before, Johnson Johnson uh, will be giving given full authorization as well. So I, I think uh, all of those uh, coupled with the uh, reduced uh, number of, uh, of vaccinations uh, taking place, I think we're in good shape from a supply standpoint. Dr. Levine. I think Moderna is weeks to a month or so behind in terms of the approval process, so that won't be a very long time. J&J, &J, it's a little harder to pin down. Um, we have been for a number of months now at a time when there is surplus of supply and not a surplus of demand. So um, clearly we're still ticking up, as you saw on the graph, with more Vermonters every day still getting vaccinated. But the supply is quite available and uh, we don't anticipate any problems. Thank you both. Leora Angle-Smith, Vermont Digger. Hi, so I have a question about long-term care facilities. Um, the slide that we have with the 62 total cases, is that just cases that are in active outbreaks or are we like missing like, the one or two cases that folks have maybe in other facilities? Dr. Levine. Yeah, those are in outbreaks. There will be uh, scattered cases in other facilities, but none with the, uh, significant numbers compared to those. What's the total number of cases can we have in the nursing homes slash, slash uh, long-term care facilities? We'll have to get you to the total number. I don't have it off the top of my head. And is this staff or residents or both the cases that we have that in the outbreak? Right, so we don't have the breakdown in those, but I can tell you the majority are in residence, but there are still staff that are affected as well. Um, we do have that information, we just didn't put it on the slide, so we'll get that. Thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Yeah, thanks, good afternoon. Um, uh, staying on that most immediate topic, I'm interested in the, uh, the long-term care facility outbreak data, and in particular, anything more you might be able to offer on uh, the outbreak in Barton. I'm not aware of the outbreak in Barton, but maybe Dr. Levine, maybe, or Dr. Kelso? It's, it's in the Maple Lane nursing home in Barton. Right, and that one actually has just come to light in the last couple of days, so it did not make the slide, but that is a fifth. But I don't have any details to give you at this point. That's under active investigation. Okay, um, then uh, if I could, a question for Dr. Calso. Um, you mentioned earlier that close contacts that are fully vaccinated don't need to quarantine. Uh, does that suggest that, that potential breakthrough cases aren't often spreading the virus to unvaccinated? And is there any guidance for this group of vaccinated close contacts to get tested uh, after they're identified as a contact? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it is possible uh, that um, some asymptomatic breakthrough cases are contributing to spread. Um, and we do, um, we stand by the guidance that fully vaccinated people do not need to quarantine if they're a close contact of a case um, because the vaccine is highly effective. It's not 100% effective, but it's highly effective. Um, we do recommend that those people have a low threshold for getting a test if they have any symptoms and um, 
it's not a bad idea to, to get a test if they're asymptomatic to go ahead and get a test three to five days after their exposure. Okay, uh, and then finally, uh, what I hope is a quick one for Commissioner PCI. Um, you've referenced uh, the UK as an example of a case pattern that Vermont's typically followed um, um, and, and highlighted the drop from the UK's peak a few weeks ago as, as for potentially foretelling for what Vermont will do. What's your uh, reaction to, um, to the recent return to increasing cases? in the UK the last uh, 10, to 10 days to two weeks. Yeah, Andrew, it's a great question. I mean, you know, we have maybe 10 examples of jurisdictions, both in the US and internationally, that we've been following. The UK and Vietnam have shown their cases slowing down, uh, in, in the UK's case, coming down and then going back up. Vietnam slowing down and going back up. So those are two jurisdictions that we're watching closely. You know, in the UK, um, they did have some significant lockdowns, you know, up until uh, the point really when when Delta was about to peak in their country and they had Freedom Day and r removed a lot of those. And uh, they also had certain gatherings, uh, sports events and things of that nature. So there's certainly a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, mobility and interaction with people uh, in the UK in the ensuing weeks when the cases started to drop. And that's, you know, I think the, the best guess at the time and, and as to why their cases are back uh, on the rise. So it's, it's certainly um, informative and illustrative for us here in Vermont to keep in mind um, as we uh, watch our cases closely over the next week. Okay, thank you, everyone. Let, let Dr. Lean uh, add to that. It just reinforces a point we made previously. Uh, two things happened in the UK. More recently, they were in a lockdown and sort of came off of the lockdown all during their Delta surge, if you will. But from the beginning, they had a strategy of getting one dose of vaccine into people as quickly as possible and compromising on the second dose, um, not to never give it, just to give it later so they could get the highest percentage of the full population vaccinated with one dose, which was a fantastic strategy for all of the strains of coronavirus prior to Delta. Um, but now with the SARS-CoV-2 Delta strain, that uh, strategy doesn't work well because of the data I presented to you showing that one dose just doesn't really cut it if you want to prevent uh, getting all those infections. So. Uh, that's why I'm very focused on our fully vaccinated rate in Vermont, uh, where I haven't done the proper research, but I think we're probably the highest in the world in terms of that number for the eligible population, age 12 and over. Uh, and I do think that's proving to be very protective for us, and I hope that can continue. Um, and again, a reminder to those who may not have yet gotten their second dose but are overdue, uh, keep this data in mind as you uh, plan out your calendar. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, I'll let you decide uh, who should answer this. Um, a piece came out today talking about a study that was finished in December of 2020 about how effective the backpack food program is. This is where schools send food home for the weekends for eligible children so that they continue to have good nutrition throughout the weekend before returning to school on that Monday or whichever day. Um, I noticed that Vermont Food Bank has it, I'm assuming it's in collaboration with the state, that they started in 2008. There's about 30 schools that are enrolled, as I can see. Uh, if this information seems to be useful, is there a chance that that can be expanded? I'm going to let uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher start off. We'll see where it goes from there. Sure, um, definitely. Uh, that is, uh, you asked about the state agency, and that's the Agency of Education through our Child Nutrition Program that um, uh, secures that funding um, for that summer program. Um, there are a variety of different grants um, that are available for child nutrition programs. Um, regarding this one, um, I, I would have to get back to you about whether we're at the cap already um, set by the federal government or there are opportunities to expand that funding. 
Uh, we work very closely with the Vermont Food Bank, as you mentioned. Um, so I will uh, get back with you with some of those specific details. In general, though, of course, if there are ways that uh, we can um, support more families to uh, get uh, highly nutritious meals, that's something we want to support. The, uh, the, this particular study was done in North Carolina, and you mentioned this was in, uh, during the school year program as well, where they sent that home, food home with them on Fridays. Are we doing that similarly in Vermont? Correct, yes. So uh, my understanding is that much of the existing child nutrition programs that um, required waivers to um, expand services during um, the height of the COVID-19 pandemic for Vermont. Many of them are still in place. Um, and again, I can get more specific details about that particular program, but you are correct in that it's both on the weekends and through summer. It's the same program. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no further questions from me. Thanks very much. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Uh, Governor, I have two questions. Uh, the, the first is uh, you, you once said that you rarely, if ever, heard from Governor Cuomo, and I'm wondering if you've communicated with the new New York governor. Um, did send uh, congratulations to her. I, I knew her when I was lieutenant governor. She was lieutenant governor, and uh, there were a number of us that were lieutenant governors at the time that are now governors. So um, I interacted with her uh, on multiple occasions previous to becoming governor. So I intend to, to reach out with a call as, as, soon as, uh, as soon as I find some time. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, uh, some vaccine skeptics say that the White House and, and your administration were unwilling to support treatments like ivermectin and monoclonal antibodies because the EUA vaccine couldn't be used, legally used, while other treatment was available. And, but now that the vaccine has full approval, uh, will you advocate for the use of ivermectin and maybe open some monoclonal antibody clinics the way Governor DeSantis from Florida has? Again, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that one. <clears throat> to be honest, Guy, I feel that Vermonters are so fortunate that we don't have to open monoclonal antibody clinics because they have another pathway to avoiding anything serious happening to them from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and that is vaccination, and they've taken advantage of that. Unfortunately, the rates in Florida are, are not comparable to Vermont, and um, monoclonal antibodies does rise high up on the list of interventions that you'd want to provide for your population, predominantly for those who are unvaccinated who will have the higher rate of cases and of severe illness. And the goal of monoclonal antibody therapy is to keep people out of the hospital. Their hospitals, as you've seen in the news, are um, you know, at capacity. Uh, it's a very severe situation down there. So they need as many monoclonal antibody clinics as possible to handle the demand so that they can keep these people out of the hospital and hopefully improve their clinical condition in a way that's meaningful. Uh, ivermectin, you've asked me about before, and um, the FDA's tweet last night only further supports what I said previously. And what I said previously was that uh, there is not compelling, strong evidence that this animal drug, veterinary drug, um, used to treat a whole variety of parasites in a variety of animals um, is effective at treating the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And I can't remember the exact wording of what the FDA tweeted. It was something to the effect that um, it's, it's for horses, it's for cows, or, and, and it's not for people, you all. Um, it was a very odd tweet coming from a federal agency, but it tried to make the point that take ivermectin off the table. Our pathway out of this pandemic is the vaccine, not a drug like ivermectin, which would only be used if you were already sick, if it actually worked. 
Thank you. Guy, I, I probably will get out over my skis on this one, but I believe the monoclonal um, antibodies and treatment is, is available in Vermont. Uh, it is, yes. Yeah, we don't have special statewide clinics, but right. many of the hospitals. Right, no, no special statewide cl clinics, but uh, it is available in many of the hospitals in Vermont. I also wanted to comment again when I talked a little bit about uh, Louisiana before. I want to be bipartisan here, uh, but Florida is uh, in a much different position than we are as well. Uh, when you, this just, just this morning, I looked at uh, their uh, death rate uh, over the last uh, month as compared to Vermont, uh, they had over 4,000 deaths. Um, so they are, um, they are in a tough position there. And I think uh, what they're doing is opening up anything that they can possibly open up uh, to treat uh, those in a variety of ways to prevent death. So uh, I think they're just uh, throwing uh, everything at the wall to see what sticks. And they should be. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Joe Gresser, Barton Chronicle. Joseph, the Barton Chronicle. All right, we will try Lisa from the Waterbury Roundabout. Hello, Jason, thank you. That was quicker than I expected. Um, good afternoon. I have a municipal question and a school-related question. Uh, the municipal one being, I read in the Brattleboro Reformer last week a story about their select board uh, discussing a local mask mandate. And it seemed to infer that should a local government body want to enact a stricter set of recommendations for their community, such as masks in indoor public spaces, that they would need state approval. Um, and I'm just curious about how that would work um, as we've got discussions that are happening here in our community after our recent outbreak. Um, is that part of the, one of the twists involved with there not being a state of emergency right now? Yes, um, that is correct. As you re might remember, uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, we did give the authority to municipalities to do what they wanted to do under a state uh, of emergency and giving the authorization to go to a stricter position. Um, in the case of Brattleboro, uh, what they wanted to do was impose uh, mass mandates and restrictions on local businesses as well as their own entities, their own employees, their own uh, public uh, spaces that they uh, had oversight on, um, which we don't believe we can give or should give. Um, they have uh, city of Montpelier uh, just recently, I think it was last week, uh, had imposed restrictions uh, on their own employees and the, the public spaces uh, that they have oversight on, which is perfectly legitimate. And I, I would advise the uh, uh, town of Brattleboro to do the same. And, uh, and we've actually uh, sent them back a letter today uh, that, uh, that uh, goes over those points and uh, gives them a path forward, much like uh, the city of Montpelier did. then a municipality has control to put a recommendation out there or a mandate, if you will, out there for the spaces that they control their municipal properties, but they can't be doing that for individual businesses. Yeah, that, think of it as a, oh, okay. a, a the local government being a business, so to speak. As businesses have that right as well. They can impose restrictions on their own a place of the business, but they don't have the authority, the broad authority, uh, to put those restrictions on other private uses. So that's correct. Okay, good. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, my other question I think might be for Dr. Levine, given the fact that the vaccine got the green light yesterday from the FDA with its full approval. I'm wondering if as this starts to happen now where the COVID vaccines become fully approved, do they now have the get the same status that 
many other vaccines have in terms of schools being able to require certain vaccinations with, you know, when kids start school. We, as a parent, you always have to update your immunization records that show that they've had measles, chicken pox, et cetera, um, vaccines in the past. So will the COVID vaccine be added to that list once it, it's fully approved? So I would answer that it would be eligible to be added to that list. Whether it will be added to that list is a decision I can't make here at the podium today. Um, is that something that happens at the state level, basically? Uh, it does. Uh, there's a legislative rulemaking process that um, incorporates that into the current mix. I haven't heard any discussions about that at this point in time, but obviously approval just occurred yesterday, so. Right, okay, well that's interesting to know. So would that be something then that would be on the, the plate when the legislature convenes in January? I can't answer for them particularly, and I think there'll be a lot more data to be analyzed before that would actually be on the plate. Keep in mind, we don't even have authorization yet for under age 11, under age 12. Uh, so right, right. Uh, there's a lot a lot more that has to happen, I would think, before you'd get to the outcome you were talking about. Okay, well good, thank you. It's good to know what the process is. Last thing for you, Dr. Levine, is I don't know if you came with any further details on the Waterbury outbreak from the, over the last couple of weeks. Do you have anything else that you might be able to share past the 31 cases that we had confirmed so far? Sure. Um, I'm not aware of cases beyond that number, first of all. Um, the camp is over, uh, so I don't think that that's an issue anymore in terms of uh, returning to something because uh, I think their end date already was arrived at. And um, there were several cases outside of the camp that had to do with exposures to um, campers, uh, usually in households. Um, right. But. That's about the most I can give you for details at this point. Did you have any other okay. specific question about? Well, the community data, well, one thing, thank you. Last week, the community data came back as a weekly thing, which was helpful. Um, it had been suspended every other week, so it was a little you know, um, lagging there over the summer. But when the community-specific data came out on Friday, it showed um, based on the previous week and last week's data that the total number of cases in Waterbury just for the month of August had been 55 cases. And at that point, we had only understood 31 cases associated with the rec camp outbreak. So it was kind of, that was sort of an interesting, you know, um, gap between those. I'm wondering how many of those 55 cases, the difference might potentially have been part of that outbreak. I don't know if there's more data that, um, we can find out in terms of the, the ages of the full 55 versus the 31. Yeah, so the gap between the 31 and the 55 is accounted for outside of that outbreak. The outbreak number is 31. So these okay, would so these would generally be, community spread. That's right. Not aware of another outbreak in Waterbury at that rose to that occasion. So these, this would predominantly involve community transmission of virus. Okay, good. Well, thanks for, for clarifying that. And thanks for getting that data out again now on a weekly basis. That's really helpful. Okay, that's it. Thank you all very much for tuning in, and we'll, uh, we'll see you again next Tuesday.